All right, let's get started. Welcome to um, CS4510. Uh, the topic of the first half of this lecture is on hierarchy theorems. Hierarchy theorems are like the first um, complexity of this is CS4510. Uh, is today the 17th, L17A? No, 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 the, the lecture. Today's the 16th. What is the, the uh, I think it's the 18th. 18th. What was it, 17? OK, yes. So today's 18th. Hierarchy theorems are basically like Hartmanus and Stearns and Lewis and others. At the early, early beginning of the, of the, of, uh, the foundation of computational complexity, they proved what are called some hierarchy theorems. And this is, uh, you know, some really beautiful results that they did using very classical techniques. Um, NP completeness came around 1971. So this is 1965, so a little bit earlier than this. And basically, the, the point of a hierarchy theorem is that we have a lot of difficulty proving NP completeness, excuse me, any constructional problem in complexity theory. We have no idea if P is uh, contained in NP. Uh, I mean, no idea if P does not equal NP, which is P space, or like exp, right? Given several classes, we have basically no idea if they're the same or not, because we still call them different things. Had someone figured it out, I know we would just keep calling them the same thing. So we have no idea if any of these are different, and we have no techniques or tools or anything to show that these classes are the same. But we can actually do contrast classes very well under one condition. And that condition is that they are about the same resource. P versus NP is about the power of non-determinism. P versus P space is about a time complexity class versus a space complexity class. Okay? Yet, we can prove many, uh, if two classes share the same resource, P is a resource about time and XP is a resource about time, we can actually prove that P does not equal XP. So if two classes have the same resource, we can prove that they're different or the same. Depends on exactly very specific formal models of computation and so on, right? We're going to prove that polynomial time is not equal to exponential time. Now, we can prove that. Unconditionally, that must be true. But that doesn't tell us anything about NP except that it's contained in between them somehow, right? Such techniques we'll talk about later will not apply to P does not equal NP. This technique we're going to prove, use to prove P doesn't equal XP. It turns out it won't work for P does not equal NP. What technique should we use to separate P from XP? Diagonalization. We're going to use diagonalization. Um, the early theorems, all uh, hierarchy theorems, they are all diagonalization. They're all just uh, a difference in resource. So. There's actually, so like sometimes several textbooks will have, different textbooks will, ha will have the best proof of something. I feel like for the hierarchy theorems, there's not a single book that does it like the best way. All of them have a different flair. And they're all kind of good enough. So I'm going to try and give you like uh, both the Papa Dimitriou way, the Mike Sipser way, and the Aurora Barak way. So first we're going to do the Papa Dimitriou way. How are we going to put a problem in XP that's not in P? Well. Recall the problem we proved by diagonalization to be undecidable was the halting problem, right? So let's just could take an exponential time variant of the halting problem. We'll call this problem E halt. E halt is going to be equal to encodings of machines and words, m, w, such that um, m accepts w within a 2 to the n uh, steps. OK? So M is a Turing machine. It runs on input W, and it accepts W within 2 to the uh, n steps. Is this language decidable or undecidable? Decidable. It's decidable. It's almost undecidable. We're not determining if M accepts W. We're determining if M accepts W within a bound. So the difference between a decidable and undecidable problem, the undecidable halt problem is like if M accepts W, 
we're basically asking the question, or like if m halts on w, we're asking the question between an infinite process and a terminating process to distinguish between the infinite and the finite. Here, we're asking to distinguish between the finite and the finite. Right? If something runs for more time, it might be infinite, don't care. If Just that were a 2 to the o of n, would, would it then be decidable? It's still decidable if you say 2 to the o of n, yeah. Because we'd have to check like all the different. But such a process can be done with maybe dovetailing. But then you'd have a recognizer, right? Um, if you guarantee that it accepts, if it doesn't accept, we'll talk today about like how to do big O versus like two to the O of n versus a literal time bound as a number versus a, a, an asymptotic complexity. There's a trick around this. We'll do. We'll do it. Um, just to give you the definitions again, P is going to be the class of languages k is equal to zero to infinity of time. Uh, n to the k. And xp is going to be the class of languages of k is equal to 0 to infinity of time uh, 2 to the n to the k. Okay. Now, exponential time is pretty big. Notice that exponential time is a polynomial in the exponent. It's not simply linear in the exponent. It's not 2 to the n. That's called e. e is linear exponent, exponential. Exponential time is 2 to the n to the k. Now, there are things bigger than exponential time. We all like practically consider exponential time to be so bad. It's huge, right? Like uh, um, you can consider run there are there are algorithms that run in time like a tower of twos, an n n twos, a tower of n twos, two to the 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 n, which is certainly greater than two to the n, right? Um, we can prove that this language e halt is in exponential time, but not in p. Why is e halt an element of exp? Because you can just simulate it. What is the runtime of your algorithm? Two to the n. Like two to the o of n. Mm. This is a this is a difficult question, uh, and the answer is not. It's actually not easy. It's so like given, so like, an operating system. How does one operating system program simulate another? Basically, they tell the computer release my control and start running those instructions. Okay, so like VMs and stuff, they simulate each other with like no overhead. Okay, programs call each other all the time. Function calls, stack frames, whatever. Turing machines don't do this. They don't have any of that. A Turing machine. If a Turing machine simulates another Turing machine, there is going to incur a cost. It's going to be some overhead, both to space and time. And we had to figure out exactly what that overhead is. We'll do so later today more, more, more thoroughly. But imagine a Turing machine is simulating another. A one-tape Turing machine simulating another one-tape Turing machine. It has to go over here, read the transition function of the Turing machine, go all the way to the end of the tape, modify it a little bit, come back, modify it a little bit, go all the way to the end of the tape, modify it a little bit, come back, and so on. Right. So it's going to take perhaps non-constant amount of operations to simulate one step of m for one Turing machine to simulate another. In fact, we do kind of know precisely how much it is. For now, I'll just say that e halt is in xp, but does not take 2 to the n time. It takes something much greater. It'll take like, I'll just say it takes 2 to the n to the k for some k. We'll come back to this question as we do it more thoroughly. This is part of this is simply like a warm-up proof. Now we need to prove uh, that e halt is not in p, right? So how are we going to do that? We're going to assume to the contrary that it is in p. Assume to the contrary. e halt is in p. Then there exists polytime decider uh, H for E halt, such that H on input M comma W will say yes or no with if M accepts W within a bound of two to the N steps. And again, N here is supposed to be uh, the length of W. 
Consider this machine D. D on input um, if h of, uh, okay, on input x, we'll say, if h of x comma x, uh, reject. Else, accept. D is going to be constructed in such a way that it has two inputs, and it runs the decider h, which is assumed to the contrary to, it, to exist. Then whatever h outputs, it's going to output the opposite. Okay. D takes its arguments, a single argument x, and it passes it to m and w. Okay. Uh, now h is going to, if h accepts, then d accepts. Excuse me, if h accepts, then d rejects, and if d rejects, then h accepts. Okay. This simply will flip the output of h. Now, if h uh, runs in uh, polynomial time, let's say n to the k steps, uh, d runs in how long? Also yeah, let's just say like o of n to the k. I'm being a little annoying and pedantic about this time steps things take, but because a lot of the theorems today are are going to be Turing machine specific, and then sort of obviously Church Turing thesis, you could generalize different gaps and things for different computational models. Here we're just going to say like O of n to the k, right? Um, what's the next step? What should we do next? What's the next step in the halting problem that we did? What is D on the code of D? We're going to run a machine on its own code, OK? There's two cases. Notice that not only does D run in time n to the k, D halts in all inputs. So D either accepts its own code or it rejects its own code. If D on input D accepts, um, what do you know that the accept call was reached? So we know that h on input uh, d comma d had to reject. Okay. If h on input d comma d rejected, here's the difference between this and the halting problem. What do you know if h on input d comma d rejected? That it took more than two of the n steps. Yeah. So either, so d on uh, code of D rejected, or we'll say did not accept within two to the n steps. I'll, I'll be verbose about, about this. D on input the code of D uh, did not accept within uh, two to the n steps. And that implies since a D runs in O of n to the k time, it must be that uh, D on input the code of D rejects. So slightly more technical argument than the one of the halting problem. We can't simply say because the decider rejected, that means uh, the machine rejected. But we can say if it didn't accept within a bound of two to the n steps, that means that uh, since it didn't accept within two to the n steps, and we know that D runs in polynomial time, on all inputs, that means it must have rejected entirely. Okay. Case two, what if D on input D rejects? If D on input D rejects, we know that H on input uh, D comma D accepts. But if H on input D comma D accepts, what do we know? We know that D on input D accepts within uh, two to the n steps. But if it accepts within two to the n steps, we know that it accepts. Accepts. 
Either way, we know that D on input D accepts if and only if D on input D rejects. Contradiction. E halt is not an element of P. So we've proved, actually, we just, we just, we did it. We just proved P does not equal XP. A separation of two nice classes. Questions on this proof? There's many comments we can make on this. One of the immediate corollaries you get for free is that, like, um, you cannot arbitrarily speed computation up. Like, what would it mean for this language to be poly time decidable? This is a machine. We're checking if a machine accepts a word. And we're checking if that machine accepts word, a word in a certain time bound. Now, what basically what this says is you cannot check that time bound faster than the time bound itself, right? You cannot check if a machine accepts a word in exponential time. You cannot check that in polynomial time. Otherwise, you could speed up exponential time computation into polynomial time computation, comp computation, which we know not to be true now, right? So computation in general cannot be arbitrarily sped up. There's no infinite gigahertz button, you know? Uh, step uh, thing number two is, okay, fine, we proved P does not equal XP, but what else can we prove? Like, how much else, in terms of time as a resource, what else can we separate from other things, you know? Did we really need to do P does not equal XP? What if this 2 to the N was like N to the log N or something, okay? What if this was like a bigger polynomial? I mean, um, how much exact time do we need? And it's kind of reliant on this proof as well. Like, what is the ex exact cost of simulation? So what I'll do for you is I'll give you uh, what I'm calling the weak time hierarchy theorem. And it'll be more obvious that it's a diagonalization proof instead of directly just sort of a copy-paste of the halting problem. And we'll, from there, we'll be able to um, sort of segue into the main proofs of the hierarchy theorems. But before we begin, are there any, any questions on this proof that E halt is not in P? E, e halt was in P, just diagonalize against it, right? Um, so we will prove uh, time of n to the k is a strict subset of time uh, n to the k <coughs> plus 1. Now, this proof we're going to do, I'm calling it the weak time hierarchy theorem. And again, now we've sort of seen a hierarchy theorem. A hierarchy theorem is basically like a hierarchy of time, like sequences of, uh, of functions that give each one giving strictly more power than the last sequence of functions, right? The last function. Um, this is also going to be a weak theorem. Not only is this going to be a weak theorem, this is going to have four bugs in it. So I want you to think about these bugs. Then when we prove the time hierarchy theorem, it will fix those bugs. But we're first going to do the weak idea, OK? Um, what we'll do, well, instead of diagonalizing this way over like encodings of machines, we'll diagonalize directly over the machines themselves. So let uh, m1, m2 be uh, an enumeration of n to the k machines. So each of these machines halts in n to the k steps. Consider d uh, on input wi. Simulate mi on wi. If it accepts, reject. If it rejects, accept. Great. We have constructed a machine. This machine halts on all inputs, so it decides some language. L of d, how long does this machine take? Okay. It simulates mi and wi, and we'll even say for n to the k steps. Okay. So d takes more than n to the k steps, certainly. How long does it take to simulate one step of mi and wi? We're still not yet close to answering this question. But let's upper bound it. Suppose it takes to simulate, this is a bad upper bound, but we'll care about optimality later, like decreasing this gap. How much, uh, if it takes, suppose it takes linear time to simulate one step of m. Now that's bad, but suppose that's true. What is the time complexity of D? Uh, 
ignoring the amount of, like assuming that it's reasonably quick to find MI? We'll talk about those bugs later. Yeah. There are four bugs in it, and that is that will end up being one of them. But suppose we could do all this, it, it's correct. We can see that LD is in time n to the k plus 1. Uh, LD uh, is not in time uh, n to the k. Assume to the contrary, it was, it was an, L, an n to the k. Then there exists an i such that L of d is equal to L of mi. If L of d is in time n to the k, then m1, m2 being enumeration of n to the k machines, uh, then there is some i such that the language decided by d is decided by a faster algorithm mi. But um, wi is in L of d if and only if wi is not in L of i, L of mi. Contradiction. Therefore, time uh, n to the k is a strict subset of time n to the k plus 1. Now, we have shown that th these are strict because we were able to put a language in time n to the k plus 1, and it was not in time n to the k. Right? There are at least four bugs with it, th this pr problem. But there is a, uh, we'll fix each one of them. Right? But this is basically the main idea. You create a machine whose whole job is to be evil. It exists only to be contrarian. It takes a class of objects and says, I'm none of you on one input, and therefore I'm none of you at all. It's going to, this machine here is going to look towards every single language that's decidable in n to the k time and decide not to do those things. And then just by the nature that it did none of those things, it, it can't be any of them. That's, the, again, the emphasis on diagonalization here. Very early proof in diagonalization. But there are four bugs in this. Let's see if we can find one. Finding i is hard. Finding i? So given w, suppose you're given an arbitrary string w. Like finding mi is hard. Hard? And also, even knowing, like finding mi may take too much time. Also, how can you even enumerate all of the machines? Can you enumerate mi? Like an O of n to the k plus one time. Can you enumerate? So here's the, what I guess what I'm saying. Is the set of Turing machines which halt an n to the k time even decidable? It is? No. It's not. Of course. I wouldn't ask you if it was. Why is it undecidable, though? Here's our first point. You cannot, there's no algorithm that'll just give you the, that'll just list out the machines that halt and end to the k time. The answer I'm looking for is Rice's theorem. A, prop, a machine halting on n to the k steps on all inputs is a non-trivial property. There exists a machine with, the, with, the, uh, with this property, a machine without the property. It's semantic. It's about the execution of the machine and not about the code of the machine, right? So the fact that the machine halts on n to the k and on all inputs is a semantic property of the machines. In fact, all the complexity classes are defined on the languages and not the machines because the languages that decide that specific class are probably undecidable. So p being a set of languages is fine, but p, if you consider the machines that have to run in polynomial time, is an undecidable problem. You, given an arbitrary machine, you cannot determine if it runs in polynomial time on all inputs. I don't even think this can be recognized. You're asking a behavior about it on many inputs, you know? So enumeration of the machine is undecidable. So we'll fix this by diagonalizing against all machines. But there's a problem. What if the machines, now we have another problem. We can diagonalize against all machines because the set of all Turing machines is decidable. It's just code. Just run it through the syntax checker. If it says yes, great. If it says no, also great. Um, but there's a problem with this, is that if, what if the machine gets in a loop? Every Turing machine is allowed to get stuck in a loop, so what do we do is we just keep a counter. But keep a counter.
that's one issue kind of solved. Okay, we'll just well in when we have done diagonalization previously, we've diagonalized against the ith machine on the ith word or something like this. So the ith set on the ith word, the ith thing on the ith thing. We're going to have to relax ourselves and do a kind of lazy diagonalization. We're going to accidentally diagonalize over all the machines and then just happen to diagonalize over the correct machines in the process. That's sort of the first non-trivial jump we'll make. There's a second error in this proof, and the second error is, let's see if you guys can conjecture. What's the second bug in this? I have four-ish bugs. OK, like two, three, two and a half bugs. Let's see if you can find a third. Let's see if you can find a second major bug in this. Wait, so wait, what do you mean by when you say keep a counter? We're going to keep a counter. The simulator D is going to keep a counter. And it's going to make sure to simulate N. It's going to simulate MI for a certain number of steps. Yes. And a Turing machine may run in polynomial time on some of its inputs. But a Turing machine has a time bound if it halts at N to the K steps on all inputs. Right. So there may be some Turing machines that accidentally halt on N to the K steps on some inputs. That's OK, because we'll right. accidentally diagonalize over those and just continue to correctly diagonalize over the ones on accident that happen to be the ones we want to diagonalize over. I mean, there's still the problem of, like, what does n to the k really mean? Like, you can pick any k. Yeah. So, well, fixed k. Suppose the proof was, like, I did this proof last year with n squared versus n cubed. I see. So let's so suppose we did that. Um, there is a, still a problem of n to the k, though, because time n to the k is not machines that halt in exactly n to the k steps, but o of n to the k steps, right? So how do you determine, for small, uh, small inputs, you know, there may be a machine that runs in really bad time. And you haven't tested it on enough time for the, for the like, asymptotics to kick in. So what you're going to do is diagonalize not against the ith machine on the ith word, but diagonalize against ev on every machine infinitely many times. We'll describe how to do that later. You diagonalize against every machine infinitely many times. What that means is one of those inputs of the infinitely many you diagonalize it against must be big enough for the asymptotics to kick in. Right? So one of the inputs will su sufficiently it'll be diagonalized against. Uh, there's a third thing is like how do you get the machines? How do you get the ith Turing machine? That takes time, right? Given i, how do you determine the ith Turing machine? We want to analyze that. So what we'll do is there's another way we can get the Turing machine. And that's sort of by luck. What we're going to do is just hope that the input looks like, a, look, looks like a Turing machine. And if it does, great. If it doesn't, well, keep going. So that'll save us some efficiency. So it's like if w happens to be the code of a Turing machine, great. Then diagonalize against m on its own code, w. Now, this diagonalizes against every machine on one input, namely the input of its own code, but it doesn't diagonalize against every machine on infinitely many inputs to give them enough time for the asymptotics to catch up. The way we fix that is we just simply say if w is of the form 1, 0 star, then we will diagonalize against m on w. Right. Now, for arbitrary, consider the behavior of the machine run on infinitely many inputs. Some, if there will exist an input like this somewhere in the future so big enough that it's big enough that the asymptotics get to kick in. And also, the diagonalization, diagonalization simulation is successful. That's basically the proof. Now, before we answer this fourth question about the, like, the simulation, oh, here's the fourth thing, by the way. Like, uh, we gave a huge upper bound of like how long does it take for one Turing machine to simulate another. And we said one step of the Turing machine takes uh, linear time of the simulator. The simulating, the one, the one being simulated makes one step, the simulator must take linear steps. Turns out this is not true. This is too big of a gap, as you may have suspected. But the gap is not zero. So we'll discuss this gap. We'll come back to this gap in another when we prove the time error key theorem. But as a warm up, 
I'm going to implement instead what's called the space hierarchy theorem and we'll apply all these little changes. Okay. Are there any questions on this? Yes. A decidable problem to know if a string is a working Turing machine? Um, certainly. You uh, take the string. It is definitely a decidable problem. Determining if a machine is, if a string is a Turing machine is decidable. Analogously, I could say that if it passes whatever syntax checker you have, your compiler, your compiler does syntax checking and all that, that's just, I mean, that's an algorithm, right? The specification of what strings are Turing machines and what strings are not Turing machines is we would consider a decidable problem. Yes. Efficiently, how would you do it? I would read right to left. I would find the first one, and then I would cast that to the. I would pass that to the syntax checker, which we can assume runs extremely quickly. Right. So, um, more questions on this before we get into the space hierarchy theorem, and then we'll come back to prove the the formal rigorous time hierarchy theorem. So we have discussed maybe there is a time, like an asymptotic minimum amount of, of time that might grant, might grant you more power. But we haven't really discussed space. So like if you had to guess how much asymptotic space, additional space would you need to grant you some power? So let's, the, the space hierarchy theorem was actually proved after the time hierarchy theorem, but it says space of something is contained within, strictly so, within space of something else, right? How much additional, if you, I, I'm just curious, like if you had to make a guess, a conjecture on the gap between space, like how much additional space grants you measurable power? Like you can definitely decide more languages because of this additional power. How much, what do we think that the, the difference is between these two? Like N. N, so like what do you, like? Uh, For each step you would like probably do like a computation well, I guess you can't because you can't bound the computation path. Can you? I mean, you can bound like each step of it, but you can't bound how many steps it takes. Don't forget, if a machine has a space bound, if you're promised it as a space bound, it does also have a time bound. It's two to the to the to f of n. Yeah. K to the k times n versus k plus one times. That's space. I think that's close. I'll write, I'll write it this way. If this is f of n, this is going to be little o of f of n. So asymptotically, it's very small. We proved that a constant amount of space doesn't change the computation, because you could push that as registers, right? So it's certainly not, the gap is not a constant amount. And in fact, the any tiniest, 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 tiniest amount asymptotic difference actually makes, is, is the gap. So in fact, space, the space hierarchy theorem is much more fine-grained than what we'll see will be the time hierarchy theorem. Time hierarchy theorem appears to have some obvious gaps in the simulation cost. Here the simulation cost is any um, little o. And in fact, what we'll prove is that uh, like if m uses uh, g of n space, then d simulates m, m in space. Like, uh, let's say, d g of n, where d is a constant dependent upon uh, m on, like, the tape alphabet and stuff. And it turns out that, like, in fact, it's, you could even get a, perhaps a more refined uh, space hierarchy theorem by saying not just big O, but, like, constant differences. Like, twice as much space gives you measurable power, it turns out. Not additions of space, but time, that's not exactly like big O, right? The big O would hide the constant, but the constant does help here. But the constant is different for each machine, something like this, right? So we'll just say, like, if it's for any constant m, it's going to just be a little O, asymptotically, right? So we'll say little O of f of n. Questions on the space hierarchy theorem before we prove it? So we'll proceed basically by diagonalization. We're going to have d on input. Uh, w, it's going to compute 
uh, n, oh, and there's a, there's, a, there's a condition here. If f of n is space constructible, do we remember this, the definition of space constructible? Did I say this last time? A function is said to be space constructible if you can compute the function itself in space f of n, right? So like whatever function that takes 1 to the n and writes down f of n, 1 to the n writes down that f of n in binary, that function can be computed in f of n space, right? So basically a function is allowed to keep its own counters without having to do something extraneous, right? You can consider some non-space constructible functions like busy, busy beavers, halting, whatever, right? But space constructible functions, all the nice ones are space constructible. n log n, f n log n, n squared, n cubed, and so on, 2 to the n. Those are all space constructible. But there are some very contrived, like cho choose f to be like the 2 to the halting problem. I don't know, something like this. That's, you, it's not obvious what the gaps are, right? So we want space, the space to be constructible, right? First thing we're going to do on input w, we're going to compute n to be the length of w. Uh, then we're going to compute uh, f of n, OK? We now have a counter, because f of n is a computable, and it's space constructible. We know exactly how much space our simulator is going to use. We're going to mark off uh, f of n cells for uh, the simulation. Uh, if any out of bounds occurs, uh, reject. So you're going to mark off f of n tape cells. And if any more are used during the simulation of m on w, you're just going to reject, OK? If w is not of the form uh, m10 uh, star, reject. We're going to just not even look at the inputs that are of the form, uh, are of, of the wrong form, because we want to diagonalize over the machines on some strings. So in fact, this is a very lazy diagonalization. It's not the ith machine on the ith word, but we're diagonalizing against every machine on its own code, which is some word, right? And no two machines have the same code, if they're, if they're different machines. Um, uh, simulate uh, m on w. And w, again, is just the code of m with some padded zeros at the end, right? So um, we have a, a, one slight other problem, OK? We're simulating a generic Turing machine on a word. Turing machines, if you don't have any conditions on them, can be allowed to get stuck in infinite loops. How should we solve this? That would help for a recognizer. Well, we have the same cycle thing. Like, you have yes. to have a cycle in your computation. We proved that a space bounded computation uh, has a time bound. Does anyone remember the time bound? It's 2 to the f of n. Basically, by pigeonhole, if you exhaust the number of configurations, you must go back to one that you visited previously and are then stuck in a loop. So if you're promised this machine has a space bound, in fact, you can decide the halting problem on space bounded machines. Right? So if time exceeds uh, 2 to the f of n, reject. Now, the machines that exceed this time 2 to the f of n are those which we don't care to diagonalize over. We only want to diagonalize against the little o of f of n space machines. So we will do so uh, this way. The other ones, if we happen to diagonalize over them, I mean, so be it. But we'll diagonalize over the, the right ones on accident in some sense. Finally, if uh, m accepts w, reject. If m rejects w, So D is a uh, sum Turing machine, OK? How long does D take uh, to run? D is a Turing machine of fixed tape alphabet. Uh, uh, but M 
has an arbitrary alphabet. So we want to ensure that there, there's going to be some overhead in this simulation. So in fact, multiple cells of D will be used to simulate one cell of M, right? So in fact, if M has this is bounded by f of n space, then we know like uh, uh, D uses at most uh, O of f of n space, right? It uses f of n space to compute f of n by space constructability. It uses f of n space to compute this 2 to the f of n. It simulates m on w. And of course, these marked off f of n cells. So of course, it's like 3 f of n, which is o of f of n. Okay? So we know that uh, L of d is an element of space uh, f of n, right? Uh, assume to the contrary. That d. Uh, runs in, let's say, g of n, uh, which is little o of f of n time. Uh, then there uh, is a machine, uh, m, which a uh, machine m uh, such that uh, D L of D is equal to L of M. Let me reword this. Assume to the contrary, there is uh, an M such that uh, M runs in uh, G of N time, which is a uh, little o of F of N time. Uh, excuse me, space. Oop, I've been saying time this whole time. Space and L of D is equal to L of M. So suppose that there's some machine M that exists that can do the same job as D in less space. Okay? Since G of N is little o of F of N, there exists some constants D, comma, N naught, such that uh, D G of N is less than or equal, excuse me, strictly less than, strictly less than uh, F of N for some n greater than n naught. That's the definitions that we get from big O, right? Consider uh, d on input uh, the code of this m, 1, 0 to the n naught. Right? Let's call this. Uh, W. Uh, then uh, this is long enough for the uh, simulation of M to complete such that W is an element of the language accepted by D if and only if W is not an element of the language accepted by L of M. Contradiction. So uh, L of D is not an element of space uh, little o of F of N. Questions on the space hierarchy theorem? Kind of cumbersome at the end there on the proof, but uh, it's sort of an obvious diagonalization that you may see before. This is not uh, something that is undiscoverable to you. There are just, unfortunately, unlike halting problem stuff, there's just a lot, slightly too many details in there. Okay, we have to diagonal. We have to make sure that we have enough, uh, uh, long enough inputs such that the asymptotic behavior can kick in. We have to bound the space 
uh, the space bounded computation by a time bound. We have to do some space constructability stuff, and then only then do we diagonalize against the machines. We diagonalize all, against all machines, and then hopefully accidentally diagonalize against the correct machines. A very small trick of the light, but the proof completes. Right? Questions on this one? All right. Let's do then the final pull, full complete proof of the time hierarchy theorem. The time hierarchy theorem is, was, of course, proved before the space hierarchy theorem. Um, so we need to discuss the time uh, difference between universal simulation, right? So if m takes t steps to uh, halt on w, uh, the universal Turing machine on m and w takes, uh, how many steps do we think the universal Turing machine could take? Just, I want, just conjecturing. Like, more than t, certainly, but how much more than t? Let's take bets. Um, how many people say t squared or above? You think it's more than t squared? OK. Uh, how many people think less than t squared? What do you think it is? I don't know. t squared seems like too much. You could do it naively in t squared. Yeah. It definitely can't. It definitely has to be. More than t, right? Like, okay. It'd be trivial if it was just t. Okay. Yeah. I feel like maybe t log t, where like the log is some sort of like way to store steps. It ends up being t log t. There is a logarithmic overhead to the universal simulation, and this is a kind of a complex proof. It's done by Stearns. He basically constructs it like a different encoding of of configurations of a Turing machine, and he keeps them in like several tracks, and he keeps all the information necessary for the computation like close to each other. And then you can prove that that takes t log t overhead. It is unknown if this can be improved. No one has really tried. I mean, log t is nothing. That's like less, less super less than polynomial. That's, that's, that's trivial. Um, but this unfortunately influences the gap uh, that we have in our, in our time hierarchy theorem. In our time hierarchy theorem, uh, we have time of little o of f of n is a strict subset of, not unfortunately f of n, but time of f of n log f of n. Something like this. So unfortunately, like con contrast this imme immediately to the space hierarchy theorem. Space hierarchy theorem is very fine-grained. Any constant amount more of space gives you su such power. Here, you have a logarithmic factor on everything. Okay? There are certain gaps, therefore, that like, oh, look, you were afforded asymptotically a certain amount more power. Too bad. It doesn't help. The difference between n log n time and n log log n time is, excuse me, n time and n, n, n log log n time might be so small that you're not, you, will, you won't have the power to decide any algorithms. You, know, you, can, you won't be able to effectively finish the diagonalization to say we have a separate class because, the, because of the simulation time here, log t log t, right? It's one of the coping mechanisms. And certainly, each different model of computation has a different overhead. Uh, certainly, better, different ones have better, better ones, right? But this is specific to the Turing machine. Again, p, very robust class, but within p, it's not robust at all, right? We said palindromes takes a one-tape Turing machine n squared, but it takes a two-tape Turing machine in linear time. So such differences exist for machine models. This is for a one-tape Turing machine. And of course, there's a condition here if uh, f of n is time constructible. Time constructibility, you can guess what it means. It's like the function that takes, uh, we'll call it, I don't know, t. The function that takes 1 to the n and writes down uh, f of n in binary takes uh, f less than f of n time. So such a function can be computed quickly, right? So 
So here's how our proof is going to work. We're simply going to diagonalize again. A D on input uh, W. It's going to compute uh, N is equal to the length of W. How long does that take in terms of W? That takes like log N time. Let's keep track of the time as we, as we do it. We're going to compute uh, F of N and store it in a counter. Um, if uh, W does not equal a machine followed by a 1, followed by a string of zeros, uh, then reject. Uh, simulate M on W, uh, decrementing the counter. If the counter ever runs out, uh, immediately reject. If counter exhausts, reject. M would be a machine, therefore, that takes more than f of n time, right? Um, but if that's not case, if that's not the case, then uh, if M accepts W, reject. If M rejects W, accept. Done. So this is a diagonalizer again over the time complexity. Now, what is the cost that D takes? Okay. Uh, before we before we start finishing the proof on this, like let's do an analysis. Any questions on this? Uh, again, the construction of the diagonalization argument here. Missing facts or anything? Computing the length of W takes like actually it takes n time. So that takes n. Uh, computing f of n takes f of n time. So it's actually going to be the min of n and f of n. So it should be, it, it's definitely not going to hold between log log n and log n, right? F, it's got to be, there's some smallest f of n that this kicks in for, and it's true. I think it's f of n is equal to n log n or, or either n. Probably n log n, right? Um, checking that it's of this form also takes linear time. Simulating m on w, decrementing the counter. You take the counter, you decrement it, that takes linear time. Uh, if the counter exhausts, reject. If M accepts, uh, if M rejects, accept. So the, again, the, the cost here is the simulation of M on W. So I claim that L of D takes, uh, at most, time. You may expect this by now, F of N log F of N. We just need to finish the proof that it does not take anything less. And then we're done. Questions on the next part? Okay, let's prove that M here does not take uh, F of N time. The proof you might think is exactly, it's exactly what you think it's going to be. It's the diagonalization again. Assume to the contrary uh, M decides uh, L of D in time G of N, which is little o F of N, okay? So uh, then uh, there exists constants uh, d comma n not such that uh, d g of n is less than uh, f of n for uh, n greater than equal to n not. Consider D on input uh, W is equal to the code of this M. One zero star, oh, excuse me, one zero to the N and not. This is long enough for 
uh, D simulating M to complete. So uh, W will be an element of LD if and only if W is not an element of L of M. Contradiction. So, again, more time, more power. In fact, we were able to be begin the class proving P does not equal XP. Here we have a more fine-grained notion of how much more time is how much more power. Now, I'll leave, I'll end the, end the uh, discussion on the time arachy, theorem, time arachy theorem saying it's an open question whether or not you can simulate this faster. But it doesn't really, like, matter. Like, the log f of n term is sufficient. Everyone has, like, fallen asleep on this. Why? Because, like, if you have two real numbers, let's say 1 less than epsilon, epsilon 1 less than epsilon 2, uh, then you know that actually time of n to the epsilon 1 is a strict subset of time uh, n to the epsilon 2, right? Any amount of polynomial is strictly greater than every than a logarithmic, any logarithmic, any power of logarithmics, in fact, right? So 2.1, n to the 2.1 is sufficiently stronger than n squared, right? Afforded even a, li a light amount of polynomial time, you're allowed a allowed large class more languages, right? Um, I, it's an open problem if you can do this faster. I don't think people care. Right. Questions on the time hierarchy theorem? Okay, I'm going to give you the statement of the non-deterministic time hierarchy theorem, and then we won't prove it. The non-deterministic time hierarchy theorem basically is the simulation of non-deterministic time Turing machines on by a non-deterministic universal Turing machine. So we'll have n time of something to be a strict subset of n time of something else. Let's take some conjectures on how little or how much time this is. Surprisingly difficult to formulate this one. This one's actually much trickier simply because uh, diagonalization occurs deterministically quite easily because easily the complement of a deterministic class is a deterministic, right? But co-NP we don't think equals NP. So the non-deterministic simulator will simulate the, no the, the non-deterministic machine by like guessing its branch and then it, that works. But how does it quote unquote guess if no branch exists, right? Non-determinism is a biased power. It's really good at saying yes. It's really bad at saying no. It says yes if a single branch exists. In order for it to say no, all branches have to reject. And doing that deterministically is not good. So I'll tell you that this is a non-trivial proof unlike the others. This is not a very simple diagonalization. You need a very complex structured diagonalization for this one. Um, but the gap is quite fine. I'll tell you that it's f of n is a strict subset of g of n. Uh, if it's the case that... Um, f of n plus 1 is little o of g of n. So surprising a little amount of non-determinism time is used uh, for the non-deterministic time hierarchy here. All right, uh, we've seen the application of diagonalization to uh, complexity theory. How, next time, when we come back from the break, we'll talk about the limits of diagonalization complexity theory. Any questions? OK, see you.